Good morning and happy Monday. Welcome to Screen Junkies Universe. So much movies this week, Dan Merle. We're so much. So much trailers, so much movies. It's going to be a big week here on Screen Junkies News. Spencer Gilbert is here. Yeah, what movies? Uh, we got a trailer coming up tomorrow, tonight um, during football for Captain Marvel. There's mm. a rumor of an Avengers 4 trailer on Wednesday morning. Joe Starr is going to be excited about that, I know. What other movies? Uh, those are the ones. That's, that's all that counts. Mm. Uh, but we do have some really interesting movie news to talk about today, actually. Things that I think a little a little different look, but mm. very interesting. Starting with the most influential movie of all time. It's been solved, you guys, by science. Mm. Um, this is via Slash Film like and EW. Researchers um, in Italy have determined the most influential movie of all time. And it is. It's a drum roll. It's not Star Wars. It's The Wizard of Oz. It had the most impact on Hollywood, according to a report um, by the Journal of Applied Network Science. So this is how they came up with this determination. They're the um, first Avengers, you know. They are the first. It's a big team up. It's yeah. actually true. Yeah. Of Different giant. superheroes from different lands. <laughs> giant gr green person. Yeah. Well, to fight a giant green person with a sky beam? His head was kind of a sky beam. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> but it was also the idea of, I don't know if we have this as much. I get, kind of, actually, we do mm. have the idea of like the man behind, the small man behind the big sky beam and yeah, robot. Mm. We do have that. Definitely. Um, she is from a different land. The rest of them are from Oz, but they are just unrelated. Um, in different parts of Oz. I don't know. Hmm. You're onto something. Uh, all right, let's talk about this. They analyzed 47,000 films across 26 genres mm. to determine. Now, caveat, they said this was like heavily geared towards Hollywood and sort of Western films. So caveat there. They said their objective was to measure the success of a movie by accounting how much of it has influenced other movies produced after its release from both the artistic and the economic point of view. We apply our method to a subset of the IMDb's citation network consisting of around 47,000 international movies, and we derive a list of films that can be considered milestones in the history of cinema. For each movie, we also collect data on its year of release, genres, and countries of production to analyze trends and patterns in the film industry according to such features. We also collect data from 20,000 directors and almost 400,000 performers, actors, and actresses. And we use the network of references and our score of movies for evaluating their career and for ranking them. Damn. So the top 10 movies are one, The Wizard of Oz, two, Star Wars, three, Psycho, mm. four, King Kong, five, 2001, A Space Odyssey, six, Metropolis, seven, Citizen Kane, Eight, The Birth of the Nation. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, nine, Frankenstein. <laughs> Ten, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Let's talk about the ooh really quick, and then let's talk about the other things. Ooh, Birth of a Nation. On mm -hmm. that list, I was surprised when I wrote it too, Dan. Yeah. And then I thought about things like the editing style and kind of just the technical aspects of that film and the influence that they had, which was notable. But then they had... I don't think they're counting the very negative societal impact of the film yeah. in this evaluation. Do you? I don't know. I, I don't think that was in the, you can it really quantify racism, yeah. but it's certainly there. Oh, yeah. didn't go you away. Can. You can count racism? <laughs> Have you been on Twitter? There's right, parts of like, Twitter you can literally count racism. What unit do you use? I don't know. That's <laughs> another whole question. Um, I, I have to imagine that they <laughs> were not including that aspect of the film's impact, which was uh, certainly present yep. and not good. I mean, negative impact is still impact. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, so researchers... Science, don't mind. Science. Um, the most influential filmmaker of all time was, according to this data, uh, George Cooker, who uh, partially helmed Gone with the Wind, though he was uncredited. There were three directors on that, as we know. Also, The Philadelphia Story. Um, Victor Fleming, who is credited, one of the credited directors on Gone with the Wind, um, as well as Wizard of Oz. Al Al pardon me, Alfred Hitchcock at number three. Um, Mervyn Leroy at number four, who we were just talking about, did a bunch of the MGM movies. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Gypsy, but it's just a. What are you guys laughing about? What wow. happened in comment that we just missed? You guys like which King Kong? Which King Kong? They're like, which King Kong? Obviously the one the with Peter Jeff Jackson. Bridges oh. in it. <laughs> Obviously the Peter Jackson Kong. The original you know? King you. Kong from 1933. <laughs> Wait, was it 1933? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Jack Black's work in 2005's <laughs> King Kong. Is from Beauty the Beast. <laughs> one <Cinema. Nicole. laughs> Oh boy. I got that date right. I'm nice. freaking leaving for Your the day. I, I don't do dates. Um, Steven Spielberg is at number five, Dan Merle. Mm. Performers 
Uh, here we go with number one is Sam Jackson, um, probably wow. because he's in 82, 82 different movies. popular yeah. movies. I get that. <laughs> uh, and he's followed by Clint Eastwood, Tom Cruise, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and John Wayne. Wow. Let us discuss thoughts, feelings, emotions. I mean, Dana? it's odd. This is the this right. is my jam. Like this is the kind of stuff that I get into. But mm -hmm. I've also found that like. I used to do a thing here where, uh, I forget what it was called, number crunch, where I would take like, I was like, I'm gonna scientifically decide uh, how, you know, I'm gonna combine Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes. And, and what I found was that while the numbers were accurate, there was like a weird X factor that it appeared to be like a recency bias in the sense mm. of like, films from, from further out had hit audiences a different way and they're rated differently by modern audiences than modern films are rated by right now. So it's, you can't adjust for that. And so I, I tried, but eventually I was just like, eh, this isn't as foolproof and I don't do it anymore. And this kind of feels the same way to me, which is like, I admire like the, the methodology behind this, but you know, I think that there are some X factors that are not like, first of all, you know, it's all of these movies, the three of them from the forties, none after 1977 mm -hmm. um I, it's harder to it's measure hard to recent. measure how recent movies yeah. have influenced film because we're going through it right yeah. now like i i honestly believe that you know people will look back at movies that were made in 2008 and say like you know that movie really influenced things in 20 years but Iron we don't Man. know that you know yeah it's also yeah. weird because it's like a russian nesting doll because it's like it's it's italian star nesting wars doll italian nesting dolls because star wars was so influenced by Space Odyssey, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which was influenced by so on and so forth, the further back you go. So it's mm -hmm. like, are we going all the way to the first film? That's the most influential one. It's like that the train, train, the train coming the train. up the screen. Like, yeah. Everything comes from that train yeah. going right for you. Well, and even. Sure, but I mean, you could say there are movies that are influenced by, because the filmmaker had an affinity for something, but they didn't, that, what the filmmaker was drawing on didn't, for example, Star Wars, influenced by. Like, why is Kurosawa not on this right. list? Right, yeah, why, how is Star you know? Wars on this, but Seven Samurai is not yeah. on this, or Hidden Fortress, or anything Fortress, else that, yeah. that George yeah. Lucas pulled from yeah. to create well, Star Wars, because if that influenced Star Wars, then technically shouldn't that be on the list? But uh, also, I mean, Kurosawa in particular should definitely be on that list of top five Seven directors. Samurai is every yeah. team up, like every, uh, we need to get a and, team together movie ever. And like, he's in influenced every Hollywood director <laughs> yeah. ever. Yeah. So every director that was on that list was influenced, well, well like, unless they were before Kurosawa. I think you can take issues like that and look back at sources. Like, um, They any, said it was all, skewing Western. Like, all IMDb lists are inherently bad. Like, according to IMDb, <laughs> like, The Dark Knight Rises is the 14th greatest movie ever made. So if they're using if they're using user rated information from IMDb, like that's already like a weird skew. And of course those people are going to, of course IMDb is going to be like Star Wars. That's it. Um, yeah. The weird one that's not on here for me, considering they said that they looked at it from an artistic and an economic point of view, and it's not because it's my favorite movie, but again, it's this, the data is Jaws. Yeah. Like for me, I think an argument could be made that Jaws was in a lot of ways. And I think, the most influential movie of the current time because Jaws was the one that, that cemented how movies are released now. Mm -hmm. The idea of of a blockbuster in the summer coming out all you know, on hundreds at that time of screens at a time, now thousands, but like Jaws was massively influential. Mm -hmm. Um but that's what I mean is like when, when you're doing data, like that's the hard thing is you can't balance for an X factor because that's not scientific. You can't yeah. balance for a concept or an idea. You have to try to do it in numbers. And it's very, I'm not slamming these, these scientists because they did a very difficult job, but like it's so hard to, to rate these things. I did something for charting today that I'm like trying to figure out popularity yeah. and I had to pick a metric and it's like, at a certain it's, point, you do. Yeah, if yeah, they picked you know. all recent movies, we'd be like, "Why isn't uh, a Citizen Kane on there?" Yeah. You know, they're they're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, but to to your point, Dan, Joss nestles very snugly into what they're describing. One, it was a huge hit, mm -hmm. um, and it absolutely influenced the industry in ter in terms of how we think of blockbuster. I mean, everyone would agree to that. How we think of what a summer blockbuster movie is, mm -hmm. it changed the way movies were made in that sense. And then think of the influence in terms of hiding the monster. And making sure making sure you don't see it, mm -hmm. which was an accident on that particular movie, but then it was repeated again and again on Alien and other movies. So, so to me, it fits very nicely in there. And so does Kurosawa as like 
directly influencing and changing the way movies are artistically created and and how the business is done. Yeah. Um, so I think you could yeah. look at you know Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and say is this more influential because it was first or is the Lion King more influential because it shaped mm -hmm. the way we look really shaped the way we expect uh, feature length animation blockbusters to come out a lot shinier a lot bigger there's got to be catchier songs uh, that they can sort of tent pull the whole thing around. Yeah. Or is well, it The Little Mermaid because that was the first movie coming out of the resurgence of True. Disney animation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, know. Nolan's not on this list. Uh, so it's worthless. Anywhere. So, <laughs> I, yeah, you kind of have to. <laughs> yeah. I am shocked if you a little <laughs> bit IMDb and left <laughs> out Nolan. <laughs> Nolan. <laughs> Nolan is in that one. He's definitely the king of IMDb. Yeah. Uh, uh, user ratings. This thing needs a little more Brahm in it. Yeah. Well, I, I, they admitted it's skewing very much uh, towards Hollywood films. Um, but even given that, you're right. We've just brought a f up a few Hollywood films where it just I think it just opens the door for the conversation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The idea that Gone with the Wind would have been hugely influential on everything that came after it mm -hmm. tracks. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, but that's not in the top no, ten. No, yeah, Gone with the Wind isn't even there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was reading Gone with the Wind as I was saying that and yeah. thinking about my own bias, which thinks that it had a huge influence, both good and bad. I um, am happy <laughs> with Sam Jackson being the most influential actor. Well, but like yeah. by sheer force of numbers, he's like, he money balls. Yes. He money balls yes yes to everything. So, However you got to do it. Um, Winner's a winner. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. What I meant to say was Wizard of Oz tracks. Uh, that is a movie tracks in a million different ways. Sure. Uh, Every movie has colors, tornadoes, <laughs> magic slippers, yeah. flying monkeys. Every, flying monkeys. <laughs> Every movie since then. Yeah, it's crazy. But actually think about it. Think about it what an epic it was. It influenced The Wiz. Yeah, for, among <laughs> others. Have you seen The Wiz? Of course. It's great. Have you seen The Wiz? Oh, yeah. Have you seen it's The Wiz? It's a delight. Oh, I've it's, seen pieces of it. It's, it's I saw the high school production of The Wiz. Delight. Yeah. And I highly <laughs> recommend it. Um, anyway, obviously all of this is open for interpretation and debate, but it's also kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And they sure did put a lot of work into it. And here's my question. Why? Like, what was the initial meeting at over at, and I, I think I know what it was, over at uh, the, 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 the Journal Network of Applied, Network, Applied Science. Network Science? I feel like this was that meeting. Mm -hmm. like, guys, we got to get traffic up. We really need to like get our brand out there. And what is something that we can do that other people will say pick up and talk mm. about and debate, and it will get uh, name recognition on our outlet? Don't you feel like that was the exact reason for? Or they're this? just a bunch of like frustrated uh, film fans that became researchers. And they're like, what should we yeah. run our robot machine and on? All How about films? <laughs> and they were all cancer. <laughs> nah. They were all hand rolling Noki while they were having this meeting. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Oh, I'm so hungry. So, Marvel news. Just this morning, Joe Star. Are you yeah. going to be excited? I hope so. Okay. Um, tell me this. Shang-Chi is getting fast-tracked over at Marvel Studios. According to Deadline, it's an exclusive from them. Um, so Marvel Studios is moving forward th with this as its first superhero movie tentpole franchise with an Asian protagonist, according to Deadline. The studio is set... Um, Chinese American scribe Dave Callahan to write the screenplay and is already looking for a number of Asian or Asian American directors who want to do something as potentially quote monumental uh, was accomplished with best picture candidate they hope Black Panther um, the goal here is to introduce a new hero who blends Asian and Asian American themes crafted by Asian and Asian American filmmakers now as far as who this character is Joe Starr you, do you want me to talk about what Deadline reports, or do you want to tell us about him? I can tell you a little bit about Shang-Chi. Thank you. Uh, so he is uh, the master of kung fu. Mm. He's very good at it. Mm. Uh, that's kind of his whole thing. Um, eventually, in the Avengers, at one point, he sort of also gets like a multiple man type power where he can make copies of himself, which I'd be perfectly fine if they did that in the movie as well, because that's kind of cool, having like... A hundred masters of kung fu burst into a building and beat the crap out of people. Uh, he's Shang Chi, sort of an interesting character. So Marvel, way back in the '70s, wanted to do an adaptation of kung fu, and this is uh, maybe the earliest Marvel Warner Brothers battle because Warner owned kung fu, and they were like, <laughs> no. Uh, so Marvel bought the rights to uh, a series of books about uh, a villain called Fu Manchu. <laughs> who, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, here's where we're going. Uh, so there, these were these like hugely, like in the aughts, these, these like pulp books about 
the yellow scare came out. The aught? Uh, uh, yeah, like ni- the 1910s. Like these... 1910s. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, the 2010s. Yeah. Um, Different aughts. This was Not four years ago. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I missed that. <laughs> I'm surprised you missed it. We talked um, about it for four days on the show. Yeah. How did you miss those SJUs? They yeah, were very, very bad. Sorry, Matt. Weird. Uh, so <laughs> they're, I mean, they're just as horrendous as you think anyone who's ever been like the mandarin is a racist superhero one you're right two you don't know how far the rabbit hole goes well um, they did say that they're going to modernize well, to yeah, avoid yeah. stereotypes so, so they uh, but like those books were like, huge there's movies uh christopher lee played fu manchu peter mm. sellers <laughs> nick cage played him <laughs> uh, when? in the um uh, the gr- you know in Grindhouse where they had the fake trailers yeah. oh yeah yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. nick okay. cage played him in one Good of them god yeah. Uh, so <laughs> so they took they they bought Fu Manchu Yikes. and <laughs> uh and they invented Shang Chi as like his previously unknown son and that's sort of where the comic character came from. Uh Jim Starlin co created him. Uh so that's sort of the history of the character. Um which I think is an interesting background for what will inevitably be a bunch of a lot of people yelling SJW at uh Asian American filmmakers taking control of this character for a movie. Um, so yeah, that, that's he's also the master of the Marvel team up. Like he's had a lot of solo books before, but mostly he's like a team up guy. Like Spider Man needs someone cool to hang out with in this issue of Marvel team up. It's usually going to be Shang Chi. He's like top shelf. Like who do we want the superhero to meet? Yeah, hmm. sweet. Okay, right. so what do you think of um, this move in terms of Marvel's part? One of the things that Dad. Uh, Deadline is postulating about is everyone's been saying, oh, what's Kevin Feige, basically, what's Kevin Feige going to do next Mm -hmm. now that he successfully launched this interconnected universe? He he and only, and they're saying clearly diversity is a thing that he's hopefully and ostensibly going to be exploring um, with more regularity, especially after the success of Black Panther. Yeah, well, I, I just think we should all take a moment and and, uh, and really appreciate how brave it is for Marvel and Kevin Feige to do an Asian superhero after allowing Warner Brothers to prove that they're viable and that a mainstream Asian <laughs> film can be viable in the film marketplace. It's a really yeah. bold move to cash yeah. in on a move that somebody else has taken the risk on and You're proven viable. You're talking about, just so everybody understands, he's talking about, I presume, Fantastic crazy, Beasts and Where to Find Them. No. Crazy Rich Asians. Yes, Crazy yes. Rich Asians, yeah. It's very brave to wait <laughs> yes. and see how and that movie does piece. before greenlighting your Asian protagonist uh, superhero film. It's great. It's great that they're doing it, but yeah. I just... I. Very brave. People always want to give Kevin Feige uh, credit for things that they haven't done yet. Yeah. Like, he's been getting credit for saying that they want to make a Black Widow movie for years now. Like, yeah. look at that. Isn't that great? Kevin Feige says they want to make a Black Widow movie. By the way, still not announced, right? No, they, well, I think everybody gave Ke- Kevin Feige what for because Warner Brothers beat them to the punch with Wonder Woman. Exactly. And then he was and like, And then he oh, bravely we'll, said, we'll, we're we'll going to make the Black Widow movie. And now yeah. Warner Brothers, once again, like, yeah. has proven uh, they they really did a fantastic job uh, with Crazy Rich Asians, both in making it and marketing it. And mm-hmm. the people behind it did a great job by not taking the Netflix money. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, it showed that uh, a film that is starring Asian Americans by Asian Americans is a viable and so i'm just like this, but to me like where was this three or four years like if you were so passionate about this character like it's kind of interesting that you're now green lighting it after another studio has done the work of proving that it just it's to me it seems kind of like a cash in if i'm being honest that doesn't mean it's bad that's great they should diversify their slate at the same time it's like i'm not going to i'm personally not going to give them a whole lot of cred points for doing it because they didn't do the legwork. They just wait. They kind of waited and saw yeah. somebody else do it, and now well, they they're like, saw, "We can do this." They also saw their own. Uh, they also saw the success of Black Panther, you know, and they were like, "Oh, great!" You know, mm-hmm. I feel like those two things probably combined. And you're right. They they waited on Captain Marvel. They let Wonder Woman um, happen and be a massive success for DC first. Um, either way, sounds interesting. Like, it yeah, be a good I mean, movie. I, the, to me, the the quote unquote bravery and the fact is like. Once again, this is someone that like not many people have heard of. Mm-hmm. This is a, it's hard to remember, but like when Guardians of the Galaxy was announced, 99% of normies were just like, is that a tree? The who yeah. of the what now? And uh, this is yet again a uh, uh, an interesting sounding, but 
relatively unknown outside of comic book circles mm -hmm. uh, a superhero that they're going to pour hundreds of millions of dollars into. So it's brave in the same way that most Marvel movies have been brave, that they're banking on just people seeing a Marvel movie, not yeah. because they have like a, a pre-existing love for the character. I think they also, frankly, bank on making a good movie. I think they know yeah. that they have the cachet of the Marvel brand at this point, but I don't think anybody is creatively resting on their laurels. I know some people will argue, and I think this is fair, that a lot of the movies feel very similar to each other. Um, and certainly the marketing can feel very similar to each other. But I do think that there's an intention there to make a good movie. True. Um, mm -hmm. And that people, if you make a good movie, even if they don't know the characters, that's the biggest lesson of Iron Man. People will go see it. Yeah. No, it's like a, it, it's like a Quiznos model of filmmaking. You know, it's, it's, it, Marvel has come out. <laughs> they're better than Subway. You know, you're going to get some type of meat and some type of cheese together. I miss Quiznos. What happened to Quiznos? Right. I'm so hungry. <laughs> they're around yeah, somewhere. really hungry. With the no gnocchi and the sandwich. Sandwiches. What's mm -hmm. going on? I haven't had breakfast. Yeah, like it's above average. It's not fine dining, but it's not. It's not like uh, you know, ninety-nine cent store uh, sandwiches. So it's like uh, they're really delivering something that'll hit the spot, and and they don't care uh, uh, what the meat is in the sandwich. What's right above Quiznos? Probably like a good like Italian deli, like a mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. around here, like a Bay City like or a something like that. Yeah, like a little nice. A overall. Jimmy John's, yeah. but it's in walking. Something distance. like real hand handcrafted mm -hmm. and, and, yeah. and unique. Um, the walking distance is important. <laughs> walking distance, only if it's in walking But yeah. Marvel toasts the bread, so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's I, not like I there's no effort. I think that does make the difference. Yeah. They who do toast the, the bread. Who's the firehouse subs of the comic book movie world? <laughs> oh, um, uh, uh, who, who, who does Ninjack? Um, <laughs> is that Dark Horse? I can't remember who Ninjack belongs Spawn to. Spawn movie is oh, going to be the firehouse subs yeah. of the, of the yeah. movie world. Billy's going to make sure that we have snacks before we go live from now on. I, don't, I, I, I stopped a, listening a few minutes ago. I had a Velveeta. I'm good going. to go. You did? Hell yeah. yeah. A Velveeta? A Velveeta. Like just a block of no, cheese? No, yeah. Velveeta. Oh, Velveeta. It's like a cracker. Okay. Oh. They're, they're, a great, they're a great breakfast on the go. <laughs> I ate an apple pie for breakfast. Nice. There's crack pie in the office that I brought Ooh. in for everybody from Milk Bar. Good. Thank well. you, Spencer. Great. No one else was excited. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody. Now that's been Food Corner with SJU. <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody, speaking of fun box office facts, is the highest grossing musical biopic. This is via Screen, right? screen Rant. Pardon me. Um, it got mixed reviews. Some people liked it. We liked it. Um, but it's the highest grossing music biopic ever. On the domestic chart, it's at $164 million currently, um, topping previous record holder straight out of Compton, um, which came out in 2015. But globally, worldwide, Bohemian Rhapsody is at $539 million, um, and at straight out of Compton, conversely, was at $201 million. Worldwide, Bohemian Rhapsody... Well, okay, so let's talk about this on a couple of different fronts. One... I think this movie had the benefit of a queen was not only popular, hugely popular when they were out, you know, mm -hmm. so in the 70s into the early 80s, but they had a resurgence with Wayne's World in the 90s, which means there was a double nostalgia hit. And you were Highlander. able, you were able to capture, yeah, Gordon. yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. You were able to capture nostalgia in a couple different generations mm. because they had a resurgence, mm -hmm. a nostalgia resurgence in the 90s, which means that anybody was there for that also felt a connection to Queen. Add to that, it's got this great performance by Remy Malek. It's high, hugely entertaining. Queen's got really catchy music. These are the reasons in my mind that this worked where some others may have struggled that are a little more niche. Question coming up is, where will Elton John sit with that? The upcoming Rocket Man. At a piano. Oh, yes. think, there you it's, go. It's actually a flying piano, Joe Star. Yeah. Did you see that <laughs> commercial for like a, like a... <laughs> I don't even know what it was for, but it was like Elton John's entire life. I think it was a department store, and it's like for, it goes backwards through his entire life. I was like, I just saw the biopic. This is incredible. <laughs> no. It stars him and then a bunch of lookalikes, and it goes all the way back to when he got his first piano for his birthday, and then it's like, a gift can make such a difference or something oh, like God. that. Oh, <laughs> God. Is it, is it for, to buy presents for, is this like yeah. a holidays commercial? Yeah, and so, it's got sign on from Elton John. I swear, I was like, this biopic looks amazing because it's going, it's like <laughs> the Camera spinning and he keeps getting younger and he's playing in different venues. Is this a real commercial? Yes. Yeah, or is this a Spencer fever dream? This I'm. Are we fact checking? Well, now I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a great idea. For Billy, is Spencer film. a liar? Yeah. Check it out, Billy. Um, Check the facts. I think you know. I think JT saw. JT saw it. Uh, <laughs> Rhapsody also got. I 
I feel like a lot more marketing and push and studio support than say Straight Out of Compton did, where Straight Out of Compton got sort of a this is a critical darling push. Yeah, but Straight Out of Compton had that stupid Instagram push. filter yeah. that was like straight out of uh, oh, straight out of yeah. blank blank straight out of blank blank. Yeah. <laughs> Straight out of um, asparagus. No, oh, no. Like, uh, it, but it was <laughs> everywhere. Asparagus. Yeah. Oh, well, they've had vastly think. different um, uh, release. I mean, they, they, they've they earned money a little bit differently, yeah. too. Straight out of Compton was a late summer hit. Bohemian it was Rhapsody. A surprise hit. It was a surprise hit. Bohemian Rhapsody is a fall hit. You get more time at the box office. Yeah. But it's still, it's, I think it's, unless the numbers change when the actuals come in, it's still in the top five here. Yeah. And it's been out for like six, seven weeks. Something like hmm. that. Um, it's 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 crazy. Audiences are loving it. And then, I know tr- Compton also costs less. It's yeah. Notably than Bohemia, so it was a in relative terms a massive hit. Yeah. No, and that's yeah. not to take anything away from Australia. Compton is a huge hit. Um, I feel like people always think that it's a competition. Like, well, Bohemian Rhapsody made more money, so Straight Outta Compton's a piece That's of garbage. Like, no, it's not a competition. It's just Aquaman you know. presale. Yeah, I, yeah. I think this um, is more feeding a hunger for musicals more so than biopics, because like Greatest Showman, uh, mixed reviews, just largely entertaining uh, popcorn movie. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. that did bazillions of dollars of business. Yeah. But globally, I can't think of another film that's done because when we talk about music biopics, they're usually about Ray Charles, Johnny Cat, like you know, either an individual, sometimes a band, but mm. not as much. But like an arena rock band, like Queen was. I mean, it's I, I, I of course I didn't even think about beyond the U.S. and the U.K. that how huge they were across the world. So yeah, of course, mm-hmm. every country in the world wants to go see this because that's what. That's what is the real appeal of this movie for me was just like it's it's Rami Malek's performance mm-hmm. and that music. I yeah. mean, my God, and the way that they shoot and stage the performances, it's incredible. They use the music really well. Yeah. Um, and he's great as Freddie Mercury. It's a fun movie to watch. Uh, there's just a number of reasons why I think it worked. It's, there's other musical biopics that I think are good, but they're a little more niche. You know, I don't think everyone around the world is running out to see the Johnny Cash biopic. You yeah. Know? Well, and straight out of Compton, when you're talking worldwide gross, I mean, that is so rooted in American culture. That mm-hmm. story, their story, where they were, you know, the, the L.A. of the 90s in the late 80s is so grounded in the American story, mm-hmm. whereas Bohemian Rhapsody is much more the story of a man and the band and, you know, these members and trying to get with this crazy front man and them traveling the world. I mean, that's so much more global in its view mm-hmm. and in its scope that, you know, it doesn't, it's, it doesn't surprise me that Bohemian Rhapsody is the done global so head. well Sub across the world. question about Bohemian Rhapsody. <coughs> How early in a production does a director have to be fired before people stop crediting him as Con- the, as his film? So <laughs> contra- everyone all- contractually, it, it's actually under the DGA rules, even though he didn't finish the film and mm-hmm. he left before it was done shooting. Um, he had done, I can't remember the exact percentage, maybe you know, mm. he had done X amount. So contractually and because of the union, Brian Singer has to be credited as the director of Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm. Um, Because I think he had done, do you know the rules, Billy? It was like more than, in production, more than two thirds or something like that. I think there's only like two or three weeks left when he left. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was curious. They're they're actually, he shot a majority of that movie. Oh, okay. I couldn't remember. Uh, Yeah. Even though he didn't finish it and so much of it happens in post and so on and so forth, right, right, right. The, the union demands that okay. he is credited. I it, it, it is. Our thoughts are with him for his health issues that took him off the movie. Oh, uh, wow. Well. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those health issues, they really jump up and get you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, couldn't finish. Well, he's doing Red Sonja now. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, everyone loves a happy ending. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What happened? What I missed? Oh, we just our our synced up uh, oh, size. The size of uh, uh, I didn't even notice it. I was so uh, deeply in my own sigh. <laughs> um, well. We've had a good show today, Dan, <laughs> and we have lots more coming up. We've got Charting with Dan. Dan teased that a little bit. He has done some incredible research. It's it's weird because this week, this past weekend, there was one movie in wide release that nobody went to see, and this week, there's none. There's mm. no movies going into wide release, so I did some, some special work that I might actually stretch into two weeks because it's really hard when there's no big movies, and I don't mean like, I don't mean like, you know, blockbusters, but I mean like, 
movies in more than 500 theaters yeah. to talk about. Uh, so yeah, I did something kind of different this mm. week and cool. I hope people like it. I think it's going to be very cool. Um, and you should definitely check that out. Charting with Dan, Honest Trailer, Honest Trailer Commentaries. I never know why I plug that because it's like, why aren't you plugging us? Yeah. yeah. Why are we plugging you? Why yeah. are we plugging you? You plug us. <laughs> yeah, we'll be discussing the uh, uh, Elton <laughs> no, John uh, uh, long form uh, commercial that totally exists, right, yes. Billy? The only you type in Ellen John commercial, you get the Snickers one. So no, oh, damn it! <laughs> I feel like not it's, lying. I don't know. <laughs> JT seen it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, JT, the most reliable source of information I feel like what on our entire was you team. We were hanging out, and one of you pitched that commercial, uh, and now you're convinced yeah. that it's real. That's what I think. Um, leave the commercial tweeted at us. I'm sure it is real. Spencer's not a liar. Um, we will be back tomorrow. <laughs> Captain Marvel trailer reaction tomorrow morning on SJU. Are you ready? Do you, what do you want to see in that trailer, Dan? Because I know what I want to see. I want to see that cat. I want to see, oh, yeah. see the space cat. Mm. I want to see the space cat. I want to see your pager go off. <laughs> yeah. What if the yeah. whole movie? What if they just show the whole movie? <laughs> it's an hour and 45 minute long trailer. trailer. I want to see great. Clark Gregg try on some Jinko jeans. Yeah. Right. That's what I want to see. <laughs> Me too. Well, we will be back with the breakdown of the jeans and the jorts and whatever else comes out. Hopefully, the cat that comes out of that trailer. Uh, there was cat butt in that poster, and we will see you tomorrow. There was definite cat butt. We'll investigate. <laughs>